The federal government is responsible for national defense, economic stability, and providing an orderly society. What do you consider to be the top priorities of the federal government, and what would you do to ensure those priorities are met? Well, the, the top priorities are specified in the Constitution, and that is to provide for the common defense, to establish a post office, to establish uh, a, a system for uh, maintaining, monitoring, and regulating interstate commerce, to provide courts of bankruptcy, federal courts, and the like. Uh, beyond that, the powers reserved in the states and the people, if it's not specified in the Constitution, that's the, that is the historical choice that we made. Now, that choice has been watered down repeatedly as the federal government, even today, has seized more power from the states. And that's really the titanic struggle that we have right here. Do we have control of our lives? Do we have control of our state? Or, do we have, or does the federal government have control? So really, the federal government provides a framework for us to exist under the rule of law, number one. That's the number one priority. We need a civil society based upon lawfully enacted laws that we all agree at some level, well, not all of us, but most of us agree at some level, is the proper mechanism for regulating our conduct. That's really what the federal government is for. It's to provide a system that allows us to operate under the rule of law, not under mob rule. Thank you. David's next. Would you like me to repeat the question? No, I got it. Excellent. Thank you. I would agree with Doug that uh, military defense, if you read the Constitution, is the predominant reason why we have a federal government. Our founding fathers were rather nervous of centralized government. They didn't like it. But they realized that if they didn't have something to make sure that a foreign power didn't come in and take them over and be under the slave, uh, under, enslaved again by a monarchy, they had to have some way to defend themselves. So defense is absolutely the number one mission of our federal government. Now, we also need a judiciary, and we also need to be able to ensure that the states operate freely in terms of commerce. Because at the time the Constitution was founded, the states were kind of cheating against each other, and they were putting up trade barriers, and they were making it so merchants for one state couldn't come to another state. And, and compete fairly. That's the summation of the Constitution, the reasons for the Constitution. Now, today, even though I don't personally believe that Social Security and Medicare were constitutional, even though the Supreme Court said they were, we made a covenant commitment to our elderly that we would take money from them and we would take care of them in their elder years. We need to honor that covenant. We will honor that covenant. And that's what makes the budget such a difficult thing, is because we have that commitment that we have to meet. We also have defense needs we need to meet. And then we have everything else that we need to talk about. OK, Jesse. Well, I think you will find that between the three of the candidates that had the courage to stand before you today in our race, you'll find that the three of us are of like mind in this regard. We're very constitutionally minded. I know on my signs and my literature we put Constitution first because I believe that you need to derive all of your legislation from that perspective. I mean, the Constitution does give us limits for what the federal government can and should be allowed to do in your personal life. Now, with that, I would piggyback off of what they say, but to some degree, there is, there is more that you need from a congressional representative. The first thing I would say that we need is we need to be effective. You know, it, there's a truth in life. What gets measured gets done. And I think it's no longer appropriate for us to send candidates back to Washington that stand there and tell you, hey, I am right on the issues, and then sit there and just speak at, at, at hominem about that, never really come and engage you, and just try to convince you why they're right. We need to be right and effective on the issues, because when you're not effective, you lose things like fiscal responsibility. You get trillions of dollars in debt that we're shackling our kids with. That's why, as your congressman, I, I've made one pledge. All the other candidates know about it, and they've refused to take it. That pledge is I will come back to every county in this district, there are six of them, every quarter and hold myself publicly accountable before you so that you can hold me accountable. That's true accountability. And what I'll do before each quarter begins is I will list publicly on my website, submit it to the media, the goals that we will achieve that quarter so you can print those goals off, bring them back, and hold me accountable to those goals. That's being effective. Okay. Hang on to that microphone because the first question is for you here from the audience. 
So, what are you going to do to support the senior citizens that have paid into Social Security and Medicare their entire lives? The, the easiest answer to that is actually bring back jobs to the economy. Are you aware that if we just drop the unemployment level back to 4%, Social Security becomes viable without addressing taxes or the deficit? It becomes viable for another 30 years. If we actually get jobs growing again, Social Security becomes more viable, number one. Number two, I'm going to leverage my experience in the healthcare industry. Are you aware that just right now, notice I'm not talking about tax and spend, which is the traditional rhetoric, because you need effective solutions. From a healthcare perspective, I can tell you this. If you address fraud in that industry, let them go after fraud, and you address tort reform, you could drop the costs of healthcare by 50%. And I'll cite the Washington Policy Center of this state where you can go and get these references from. Now, if you drop the costs of healthcare by 50%, imagine what that does to the certain promises that we've made to you in terms of Medicare and Medicaid. And then all of a sudden we can start talking about balancing the budget and getting the economy going again because two of the, th two of the big cost drivers of our federal budget are Medicaid and Medicare. But see, when you send someone back that's your traditional candidate that has to talk from a script that was given to them by some consultant, they can't talk to you articulately about the adjudication processes that the healthcare industry goes through. You send someone back with practical experience and we can be effective for you day one. Thank you. Same question. I think that part of the reason why I'm so focused on the debt is that governments typically in history solve debt problems through inflation. And we're not talking little 3 4% inflation. We're talking 10, 20, 100% inflation. And anybody that's on a fixed income will find that that amount or the hundreds of thousands of dollars you saved in your 401k will be able to buy you a cup of coffee. That's the danger of this debt. This explosion of debt is going to be solved in a way that is really going to hurt the elderly. And you and I know the government statistics are constantly being re redefined in the whatever way suits the government so that they can say, oh, there's not so much inflation. But yet it costs so much more to live. And you don't get an adjustment because the government says, well, CPI didn't go up that much. That's the danger. If we get into high rates of inflation, we have to address this debt. Because if we don't, it won't matter whether you still have Social Security or not. It won't be able to buy you anything. It's crucial that we stop the bleeding. We get the patient stabilized. It's basic triage. Thank you. And Doug. Well, of, of all the social welfare programs, uh, Social Security is the one that should be prior, prioritized, in my opinion, because it can be made actuarially sound. We, at some point, in any kind of insurance fund or pseudo-insurance fund, there has to be a match between benefits received and receipts uh, received by the government. So that's really the truth. We have to balance those two, and there's a number of ways that that can be done. Now, in regards to, to Medicare, Medicare, um, the problem with Medicare is the federal government fixes prices of health care services that they'll pay for, and that doesn't do anything to ensure comp com competition. Competition will reduce health care costs. We've seen that in LASIK eye surgery, which is not covered by the government, which is not typically covered by insurance companies. And now you can get LASIK eye surgery for about 8% or less of what the original price was. We never see that in our health care system at all because the government fixes prices. We have to get them out of there in that regard. There has to be more competition. Finally, there's been too many people using the Medicare system as a piggy bank. Too many uh, areas of the health care industry go to their congressmen and say, we need a raise, here's some campaign contributions, give us a fixed price so we make more money. Again, we need to introduce free market processes into Medicare and Medicaid. Competition.